before we get into the, the normal uh, uh, del, uh, drill of things today, uh, we do have a, an important announcement, uh, and we brought today IRS Commissioner uh, Doug Schulman <laughs> and Education Secretary Arnie Duncan here uh, to, to talk about something that is extremely important uh, to millions of families uh, each and every year, and that is the simplification uh, of the federal financial aid application. Uh, and I will turn it over to uh, the commissioner. And I will switch off the Thanks. Uh, I'm very proud here uh, to be here today on behalf of IRS and the Treasury Department uh, to partner with the Department of Education to be part of the President's initiative to simplify the student financial aid application process. Uh, the current application is lengthy and Burdensome, the secretary brought a, a chart you can see, becomes an endurance test for students and their families. They're faced with pages of financial information, financial information they don't even need to put on their tax forms, and many simply don't apply for aid. It's a great loss for students, it's a great loss for families, and it's a great loss for the nation. However, by removing needless obstacles and using data that the IRS already has, we can put students on the path to a college education and the road to success. Uh, this is a real example, I think, of uh, this administration having agencies work together and departments work together, uh, not to defer the, further the IRS's goal or the Education Department's goal, but really to further uh, the goals of the American <laughs> people. And so I'm very proud to support the Secretary on this effort. Thank you, Doug. This is a, a really exciting day for us, and I want to thank a number of people before I begin. First, to our Treasury Sec Secretary, Tim Geithner, for his leadership, to Doug and the IRS, and it was actually interesting. We had lots of people both internally and externally said the IRS will never participate, they'll never do anything, and these guys have moved with lightning speed, and it's really been because of Doug's great leadership, so thank you so much for pushing. And as you may know, Rahm Emanuel, the Chief of Staff, worked very, very hard on this when he was in Congress. And so all that collective effort has been great. Internally, Bob Shireman has been the driving force in our team. I want to thank Bob for all of his hard work. And the real innovation and creativity has really come from our career staff. And there are four people I want to thank quickly, Michelle Brown, Shamarly Colick, Ginger Clock, and Andrew Jones. They're the ones that made this happen. Today, I'm proud to announce another major step to make college more affordable and accessible for students. We have made major changes to the federal student application form, known as FAFSA. The debate about how to simplify FAFSA, I think, has been going on for over 20 years. So this change is long, long overdue. In the past, students were looking to apply for aid online, were presented with over 29 screens filled with questions. And you get a little bit of a, a sense here of the reality of what our young people are facing. It was an intimidating hurdle. Too many students who qualify found applying for student, student loans was too difficult to understand. Too often, they simply got frustrated and they gave up. The form itself was literally a barrier to entry in college that has to change. It was something that was of, uh, of great consternation to me when I was back in Chicago. That's why we've worked hard to make the form shorter, simpler, and more user-friendly. Next year's applicants should see a 20% reduction in the number of questions and a 50% reduction in the number of web pages to navigate. And I'll try and give you a little bit, Bob, maybe help you before and after. This is before. And this is after. Instead of navigating through every possible question, whether it applied to you or not, applicants will only be presented with the questions relevant to them based upon previous answers. For example, if you indicate that your mailing address is in Chicago and you plan on attending the University of Illinois, we won't follow up by asking you if you're a resident. In the coming months, we will further modernize the online application by creating an easy process for students to apply by using data that the IRS already has. The improvements will reduce the burden on the 16 million students and families who apply for federal financial aid every year and are designed to help increase college enrollment among low-income and middle-income students by making it easier to apply for financial aid. We absolutely have to educate our way to a better economy. Our young people and adult learners deserve the chance to go to college and to know the money they need is available. Earlier this year, as you know, the President laid out a very, very clear goal, that America will once again have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. The administration has taken several important steps in that direction. 
In addition to Vice President Biden's work on college affordability through the Middle Class Task Force, we've made changes to the direct loan program that will help make it a more reliable, stable, and efficient resource for students and for parents. In the Recovery Act, we provided $14 billion in tuition tax credits and $17 billion to shore up the Pell Grant program. Now we're taking steps to make sure that there are no more budget shortfalls in the Pell program by making it a mandatory part of the budget. We also plan to create incentives to reward universities that keep tuition costs down. And we have proposed $2.5 billion in funding for states to improve college completion rates, attainment, for low-income students. These are all important steps in increasing access to college and opportunity for America's students. Thank you. What's the total amount of uh, loans that are outstanding at this point? Uh, very, very significant, Bob. You know, yeah, half a trillion dollars. Half a trillion. Yeah. Yes, sir. How much should universities be held accountable for the fact that they they took advantage <coughs> of the fact that students had easy access to credit, so they jacked up their tuition rates, and now you know you guys are announcing all of these student loan things, but and you said you're providing some assistance. Can you talk more about what it is? How you can encourage these universities that that, that maybe they they overprice yeah well, two things we're going to put we're we're thinking this through collectively but we want to put significant incentives on the table to reward those universities that are keeping t uh, tuition costs down but I really think the marketplace is going to correct this what you're seeing now is you know families have thousands of great colleges to choose from and going to college has never been more important it's never been more expensive and families have never been under more financial stress and duress as you guys know and what you're seeing is more universities starting to think creatively whether it's three year options whether it's no frills campuses and you know our parents are smart our students are smart in places where where, you know, costs are skyrocketing, I can think you're going to see people vote with, your, vote with their feet. What are the incentives? Well, we're, we're working through that package now, but we're going to create some financial incentives to really reward those universities what that are doing the right thing. I mean, when you say that, I mean, is it more research yeah. dollars, stuff more, like that? More money. More money. We're going to put money on the table to reward people who are doing the right thing. We want to think through the right incentive package. Sure. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, can I ask uh, Mr. Shulman yes. something? Um, you know, the, the IRS right now is working on the President's efforts to close the tax gap, uh, you're getting more IRS agents on, on the job. I'm wondering how big a responsibility this is for the IRS and what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, burden or, or extra resources you might have to, to deal with this. Yeah, as you said, closing the tax gap is a, is a major priority. The President uh, gave us significant new resources uh, in the budget that's been sent for 2010. Um, you know, we also have a huge service organization. Uh, there's a lot of Americans who uh, are just trying to pay the right amount of taxes. We have phone operators. We have a heavily trafficked website. And so this folds right in uh, with our view that what we need to do is help American people where we can. Um, this is something that we can do that uh, demonstrates that government can work together. Uh, we can do it in a way that, that isn't going to divert a lot of resources, um, especially it won't divert any re enforcement resources. Can you just explain a little bit more what, what the IRS's role is going to be in, in helping, helping do the forms themselves? Yeah, I mean, it's very simple. Um, this Department of Education owns the FAFSA form, um, is responsible for, for getting it out. Uh, but there's a lot of financial questions, and a lot of those questions right now, people have to tick and tie between their tax form and FAFSA with complicated questions. So we're actually working with the Department of Education. When you're online, you'll be able to hit a button and say, do you want to go get your IRS data? Um, a screen will pop up, you'll get yourself into the IRS website, and we'll feed back to the taxpayer the exact data that they need to put on the FAFSA. So it's, you know, we have a, we have web application that lets you know where's your refund, uh, where's a, a lot of different information. This will just be one of those web applications. Mr. Duncan, um, I want to ask you, are financial aid uh, stipends and Pell Grants going to students instead of directly to the university still. Is that still the case? Yes, yes. And again, I just want to be clear, this form itself was a huge barrier to entry. This was something that was literally preventing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of students around the country from going to college. They couldn't negotiate this form. And so I just want to thank both teams for working so hard to, to fix this. Yes, ma'am. Now, with a follow up to that, um, I understand this administration wants to make sure that colleges and universities are getting the Pell Grant monies. Uh, I understand that, what is it, $637 million is expected to go to HBCUs from Pell Grant money. 
but many of the university presidents are very upset saying, you know, we may not get this money, all of the money that is allocated, because it goes to the students. And sometimes you have to rob Peter to pay Paul, some of these students are yeah. saying. No, I really don't see it that way at all. What we want to do is dramatically increase access for families, you know, middle-income families, low-income families. Uh, on the HBCUs, our estimate is actually over the next decade, over the next 10 years, it will be an additional <laughs> $3.2 billion that will go to those universities. So think of all the students out there who don't have access, who have much more access. We're increasing the, the dollars involved in the Pell Grant each year as well. And so this is a huge win long term for the universities, but most importantly for young people who have this college dream. And I worry a lot about this. This is part of the reason we want to make the Pell Grant mandatory. I worry a lot about dreams dying young for children, that at 9 and 10, 11 years old, smart kids, kids that are working hard, if mom or dad loses their job or takes a big you know, pay cut, they might start thinking college isn't for me. So this idea of saying this money is going to be there, regardless of the craziness that your family might be dealing with, we think is very important. So even though they get the checks personally, you believe that the vast majority of the money still goes to the college? It's helped, yeah, it's creating access for students to go to college, absolutely. That's where it goes. And given the kind of uh, budget pressure many states are under, do you find that many states are having to raise tuition right now, even if you're trying to increase it? Yeah, sure. Some, some universities are raising tuition, but what we're seeing is the question, you know, as earlier, we see some places where it's skyrocketing. And so what we want to do is really reward those folks that despite the budget pressures everybody's feeling, universities, states, local governments, you know, families, we want to reward those, those places that are doing the right thing. And we also want to have a greater focus going forward on attainment. So again, we have $2.5 billion in the FYL 10 budget to reward and to help build a culture at those universities where it's not just about students getting in the front door, but where they're graduating with that piece of paper. Yes, ma'am. I noticed that the IRS pre-population is for FAFSA spring filers only. Uh, what percentage of FAFSA filers does this constitute? And do you plan to expand it to all FAFSA filers eventually? Yeah, we're going to pilot it, obviously, in, in uh, January where those students are starting school then and then go look for the following year to do it on, on a more broad basis. But it gives us a chance to really test this thing and uh, figure it out. With the thinking of going with the spring semester to avoid the prior prior year issue and, and the tax data not being out of date? And also just to pilot, make sure we're doing this thing right before you go nationwide, you know, start it on a smaller number and uh, make sure we're doing this exactly right. About reducing the amount of paperwork, do you have any idea how much time will be reduced? Yeah, we're well, trying to get those estimates. We think it's a very significant amount of time. I don't have a hard number on that, but when you think about, you know, uh, dramatically fewer questions, half the number of screens, we think the time savings is going to be very, very significant. And it's not just to be clear, it's not just the time, it's the complication, it's the degree of difficulty. And again, I worry a lot about families that are, you know, first generation going to college, families, you know, English is second language. That first slide is pretty intimidating. This thing is a little bit more friendly. If this means that more students will fill out the application and more students will get student loans, do you have an estimate of how much more it's going to cost ultimately? Um, I, I don't have a, a firm estimate on that, but again, we think that's not a cost. We think that's an investment. We think the best thing we can do as a country is have more young people going on to college. So we think this is absolutely the right thing to do. This has to cease being a barrier to entry. So you'll expand the pool of money? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we want to take care of all the kids. What we actually have now is interesting. We have significant resources in the Pell Grant program that go unused each year. We think part of the reason it goes unused is because this thing scares people off. And so we may have to increase the pool. We may not. Um, we may just have more, more people taking advantage of the resources that are already out there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. A high percentage of Hispanic students, because of their parents being poor, mm -hmm. their fathers losing their jobs, um, they cannot afford to go to college. And that's their dream. They want to go to college to have a better life than maybe their parents. Uh, how can we get this information to them? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We're actually going to launch a campaign starting this fall, with the upcoming school year, to make sure that every high school student knows that this is available. And to be clear, what we want is not just a campaign for high school students, but if we can move the Pell Grants to the mandatory side of the budget, I want to get that message out to, again to 10 and 11 and 12 year olds because I worry about those families where the dreams start to dry, die at an early age. And so this is a campaign to do the right thing and to spread the word. The fact that we have money that goes unused each year is absolutely crazy. It's no good for families, no good for the country. And so we're going to work very, very hard to publicize this around the country so that students know if they work hard, if they have that dream, we're going to try and meet them more than halfway. That's very important. Yes, sir. Um, I understand that part of this would require legislation. What, what are some of the key things that would require that? And what's your read on Congress? Yeah, this part requires no legislation. So this is a done deal. 
this is moving. There's some other questions um, about other assets family members have that would require us to go to Congress. We want to do that. Uh, Chairman Miller has been very, very supportive, and we're hoping that will move as well. So this is a, a very, very significant first step, but there are subsequent steps that will, that will happen to the, uh, the, the, uh, the partnership with the IRS, and then even removing further questions from the forum, we think we'll get this thing simpler and simpler. So we're going to keep pushing hard in this direction. Okay. I have a question about a separate subject of having to do with education. Sure. Just about the, the, uh, the race to the top. Are you worried at all that states are going to run out of money? Miss, I'm sorry, I, run out of money. Miss out on money in the, in the race to the top and the $5 billion that you can allocate. It's not about states missing out on money. What we're going to do is we're going to invest very significantly in a number of states who are going to lead the country where we need to go. It's going to be very competitive. Uh, we'll be coming out in the next couple of weeks of what that application is going to look like. Um, as you know, the President's, you know, tremendous leadership and Congress's support, we have unprecedented resources. What we're being very clear is with unprecedented resources has to come unprecedented reform. And if all we're doing is investing in the status quo, that's not going to get us where we need to go. So we're going to invest lots of money in a number of states that will literally lead the country where we need to go. I think we've had a race to the bottom around the country that has to stop. And uh, it'll be a competitive process. We're going to be very, very you know, objective and transparent about this. And we want a set of states to demonstrate to the country what's possible educationally. Um, we'll probably do this in two rounds. So states that don't get in the first round will have a chance to go back and look at you know, what, where they're deficient. And every state that doesn't, who applies, who doesn't get through, we'll send them a letter saying this is where you missed and this is what you have to work on. But investing the status quo is not going to get our country where we need to go. This is about a very strong reform agenda. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, just one quick announcement before we get going with questions. <clears throat> on his uh, upcoming uh, trip overseas <coughs> on Friday, July 10th, the President will visit with the Holy Father, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, to discuss a range of issues including their shared belief in the dignity uh, of all people. That's uh, on the upcoming trip. Pardon me? Do they have any church service after that? Uh, I can assure you, April, we're not joining a church uh, in Italy. <laughs> I know. But you know what I did? I just fast forwarded right to the follow-up. I'm going to do that. That's actually what I'm going to do all today. So if I don't answer your question, I will presume your follow-up and answer that instead. Yes, ma'am. All right. This could be right. This would be like a 10-minute deal. <laughs> Is Mrs. Obama going to the Vatican as well? Uh, she will, as far as I know, be uh, on, on the entire trip, yes. Okay. Um, Syria, sending an ambassador, a U.S. ambassador to Syria. Was there, was there any um, behavioral or policy change or discussion on Syria's part that, that prompted this decision? Well, uh, Jennifer, I think you know that we have had a series of meetings with um, administration officials and Syrian leadership. Um, I think this strongly reflects the administration's um, recognition of the role Syria plays uh, and the hope um, uh, of the role that the Syrian government can play constructively to promote peace and stability in the region. Uh, and it continues the President's call uh, to be more fully engaged in the region. Uh, so there have been a series of meetings uh, throughout the beginning of this administration. But no policy change on their part? Uh, not, uh, not anything uh, explicit in order uh, for the President to move to fulfill his promise to more fully engage in the region. Robert? Robert? Hold on one second. Let me go here. Yep. Which well, was sort of on a related subject. I mean, as you're um, now sending an ambassador to uh, Syria, um, on the subject of Iran, the, the leaders there continue to blame the U.S. and the West for the protests that, that occurred afterwards. Um, does that just make it more difficult to um, in, engage Iran, as, as President Obama has indicated he's willing to do? Does, it, does that push that off for, for later in this year or even longer at the earliest? Well, I, I, think, is the, I think the President addressed this pretty clearly yesterday uh, in the notion that um, uh, the focus right now is on 
uh, our focus right now are on the events that are on going on the ground uh, that we've watched uh, for the past many days uh, since the election. Um, again, there is, I think I said, I've said this recently or said this to somebody, that uh, there's an outstanding direct request that the P5 plus one made to Iran on April the 8th, uh, an invitation that uh, uh, has yet to be responded to by them. Yes, sir. Uh, during the campaign, uh, then Senator Obama and then Senator Clinton uh, fought quite a bit uh, about the question of individual mandates. And the president, I understand, uh, said uh, to Diane Sawyer that his thinking has evolved on the issue. Mm -hmm. Can you just explain the process by which his thinking has evolved and, and why it has and why he has changed his position? Well, I think, uh, look, I, I think what's paramount in this, Jake, is that um, uh, as the process moves forward in the Senate and the House, the President wants to be uh, flexible to the notion, to the degree to which um, uh, a, a piece of legislation will come forward. In terms of, uh, in terms of ensuring that everyone is covered, uh, the President is now open um, to, uh, to this idea. Uh, I think there have been, uh, in discussions with all the parties and stakeholders involved, um, there has been discussion about uh, that it will be hard, harder to get everyone at the table to stay at the table if, um, if you're not getting uh, that larger universe of people covered. And I believe that on both the left and the right. Does he see... Um, well, let me also say that, uh, and I think as the President said in the interview, um, there are a lot of obviously specifics to work out, including uh, he's a, a big believer uh, in the notion that there has to be a, a pretty stringent hardship waiver. Um, I think the President said throughout the campaign, very few people can afford it, don't, or don't have it because they can afford it and don't want it. It's because they can't afford it. Uh, if the help that they're getting is still not sufficient enough uh, to have them afford it, then we have to examine uh, a robust hardship waiver. Does he have any specific um, lines that he would not cross when it comes to what penalties people get? And, and does he view health insurance the same way that some people view, well, the same way that all states view auto insurance if you want to drive, you have to have car insurance? I, I don't know that... Um, um, I've not heard him speak uh, about the first part, uh, about the specifics or details of something like that, except for the broader hardship waiver. Yes, sir. Robert, can you tell us a little bit more about what was in the letter that was sent to the Ayatollah uh, prior to the elections in Iran? Well, uh, I think as each of you know, um, the administration has indicated a willingness uh, to talk with uh, the leadership in Iran and have sought to communicate with the Iranian people uh, in, a vi in a variety of ways, um, but I am I am not going to uh, not going to get into anything other than the notion that uh, you all understand the president uh, uh, has spoken throughout the campaign about being engaged. And is that communication late continuing at this time? Uh, there has there has been no communication uh, with Iranian officials uh, since uh, the election, but I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to confirm or deny anything that uh, uh, around this. And then briefly, um, we had uh, there was a woman on the phone with CNN uh, describing some of the violence that was taking place as people were leaving a mosque. Um, what what has the administration been able to find out about this incident? And and is there um, are you troubled at all by this continuing violence on the ground? Well, I, I mean, absolutely. I think you heard the president. Uh, uh, I think you heard the president address this yesterday. Uh, you know, obviously there are, are many here at the White House that continue to monitor the situation. Uh, the president is updated uh, uh, routinely uh, on uh, what we see, um, and obviously uh, continues as he's expressed uh, since the Monday after the election. Uh, great concern about the violence. Can I just follow, Robert? Yes. Uh, thank you, Robert. Um, since President spoke in uh, 
Turkey and also in Cairo and, and Egypt and also yesterday at the press conference, he made it very clear that his message should go very loud and clear in the Muslim world. But it seems to me that they are not hearing yet his message. You think he's going to change any strategy or any new ways to reach them out? And also Chinese. Do you mean and the larger Muslim world, or do you mean your, yeah, the in Islamic? In Iran, yes, sir. Well, but I, also, I, I mean, I think from what I can read in the newspaper, I think there are a number of Iranians uh, that are, um, uh, or at least uh, I, I read a couple of articles in the newspaper th this morning that denoted uh, that uh, some of those messages that the president has talked about have been heard. I think you saw that we went. Um, uh, to some links yesterday to ensure that what the president said was was translated um, in a way that was uh, protected in terms of ensuring that uh, we were comfortable with that translation. Uh, I think, but I would separate this from the broader engagement of the world. I think the president is uh, uh, is and will continue to uh, focus on improving our relations. Uh, to strengthen our own foreign policy. Uh, yes, so Robert, Chinese and uh, Iranians are warning the United States, including the president, not to meddle in the Iranian affairs as the elections are concerned, the outcome will not change. Uh, I, I think the president has been clear about enunciating the universal principles that we uh, all hold dear and that we all stand up for, uh, while at the same time n ensuring that he's uh, not a foil or a political football to be used by the regime against those that are demonstrating. Chip. Uh, Secretary Sebelius in Capitol Hill uh, today suggested uh, that the president, or that the administration would be flexible on the issue of taxing employee uh, health benefits if that's what it takes to get a bill. Where exactly does the president stand on that now, and has his thinking on that evolved no, also? I, I, I think the president, if I'm not mistaken, in the same interview that Jake just made mention of, uh, was asked uh, this question. Is I think he and I have had the opportunity to uh, be asked and answer that question for uh, uh, some consecutive number of weeks that uh, I don't have at my immediate grasp. Um, I think the president has laid out 900 and almost $950 billion uh, that he believes uh, is the best way forward uh, to ensuring that each and every uh, penny spent on health care reform is fully paid for. Not flexible on that. I, I would refer you to the transcript uh, of the president's own uh, eloquent words on that. Robert? Well, can you uh, uh, tell us uh, what he well, told you? It, it, Chip, I, I'd point you to the transcript that he said on ABC, t uh, taped yesterday, printed today. Uh, I think I would point you to his interview with uh, Bloomberg and MSNBC the week before that. Uh, and any number of times in which uh, I've discussed this with questioners on the first, second, third, fourth, and uh, likely fifth rows of, uh, of the briefing. Yes, sir. Robert, there was a wire report uh, before a commander having to do with it's possibly the administration was rethinking these invitations to Iranian diplomats on the fourth. Did something change? Has that changed? Well, uh, I think as you all know, many weeks ago, um, the administration extended uh, an invitation to celebrate the freedom that this country enjoys. Um, not surprisingly, based on what we see going on in Tehran, nobody's RSVP'd. So that's what it is. Well, no, hold on, let me finish. Okay. Understand what, and you all do, July 4th allows us to celebrate the freedom and the liberty we enjoy. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to assemble peacefully, freedom of the press. Um, so I, I don't think it's surprising that nobody's signed up to come. Uh, given the events uh, of the past many days, uh, those invitations will no longer be extended. Fair enough. All right. John? Uh, but let me clarify. You just said that those invitations. Well, let's, uh, there's nothing to clarify. I think I was pretty. Okay. I was. Let's just say this. I was clear enough that Chuck didn't follow up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what you're saying is that somebody RSVP'd, 
No, I said nobody's RSVP'd. Had right. somebody RSVP'd, would they have been allowed in the door? Uh, well, it, I appreciate the hypothetical that no longer exists uh, on no, God's wait, wait, green earth. Uh, but again, the I, I know. I, <laughs> why I scratched the scab, I'll never know. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but Are the invitations rescinded is the yes. question. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and was, that, was that your question? Yeah, I was going to be my question. And, 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 and to follow on, the, the meaning of that would be, is that, is that a signal that uh, the invitation for talks that are, were extended April 8th at P5 plus no, 1? That, uh, that, uh, that invitation has also not been addressed, uh, but that inv invitation uh, continues. Now, on, along that line, the president yesterday, when he spoke of the pathway um, that Iran has, uh, <coughs> including these universal rights of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, uh, freedom to not be to not be repressed violently. Mm -hmm. um, would you consider those as new impediments or, or new hurdles for the Iranians to cross before they could get down that path? <clears throat> Toward direct engagement? Well, I, I, I'm not going to add a lot to what the President said. Uh, I think our focus right now are the, on the events on the ground, understanding that we continue to have long-term interest in Iran. Yes, sir. Um, you said that there hadn't been any communications with Iranian officials since the election. Right. Uh, what was the, the most recent communication uh, with them? Not going to get into that. I got a procedural question about yesterday's news conference. Mm -hmm. What led to your decision to uh, plant a designated hitter uh, right here to ask the president a question? And um, what kind of a message do you think that sends to uh, the American people and to the world about the kind of free flow and pure questioning that's been expected uh, at presidential news conferences? Well, I, I think it did nothing more, more than underscore that free flow. Uh, Peter, that was a question from an Iranian in Iran uh, using uh, the same type of manner and method uh, to, to, to get that information as I guess many of you and virtually every one of your outlets has done because in this country we enjoy the freedom of the press. In Iran, as many of you know, your colleagues have been dismissed. They've been kicked out. Some of them have been rounded up. Uh, there aren't journalists that can speak for the Iranian people. What the president did uh, was uh, take a question from an Iranian. That's, I think, the very powerful message that that sent just yesterday. Couldn't he have uh, accomplished that without um, you guys escorting someone through here and, and planting them in the room? Uh, did you get a question yesterday from an Iranian that you had hoped to ask the president? No, I did not. Well, then I guess the answer to that would have been no. Is this going to, be, so, is this going to become a, a regular feature of President Obama's news conferences that you all are going to bring people in here that you select to ask questions? Well, let, let's understand. Let's be clear, Peter. I, I think you understand this, so, but I'll, I'll uh, repeat it for your benefit. Um, there was no guarantee that a question, the questioner would be picked. Uh, there was no uh, idea of what the exact question would be. Um, I'll let you down easily. A number of questions that we went through in prep, you all asked. <laughs> uh, I, Iran dominated the news conference, not surprisingly. Uh, but Peter, I, I think it was important, and the President thought it was important, to take a question using the very same methods, again, that many of you all are using to report information on the ground. I don't have any, I won't make any apologies for that. Uh, can I follow that one up, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Get the mic ready. Uh, aren't you, uh, uh, you and the President aware that this casts suspicion that all of such questions may be presidentially planted. <laughs> well, you know what? Instead, Lester, of giving you an answer from here, I'll ask that you ask Chuck, Jennifer, Chip, I'm not Jake. I'm drawing suspicion no, no, on, on them. You are. No, no. I, I mean, no, no. The, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, let, let, I, can I give you 30 seconds to get your question straight? Major. Uh, and others that asked questions yesterday, ask them right now if they knew they were getting a question yesterday. Go ahead, ask one of them. Well, 
that go ahead. No, no, I make hold on. Let me make hold on. Believe well, that, I, that we okay. ask questions that are pre-approved. And do doesn't you? this add? Of do course you? not. Okay. But so this how do they get that misperception? Perception? No. And doesn't it Chip, allow I feel like you have. What we do? Robert, Robert, I feel like. Hold on. Hold on. So, so you but don't let me. Know, let, you let, don't know but since I'm not a journalist and I play the spokesman on TV, let me answer one of the questions. Okay. Do you? One of the things I love, Lester, is you move the microphone toward your mouth when you laugh as if the sound might not pick that up. All right. Leaving that aside for a second. Leaving, leaving that aside for a second. I have one follow-up. No, no. I, I, can, I, I can in my wildest dreams believe it's only one. But just hold on. No, no. I know. But let me. I want to. Chip and Chuck have questions that I think are important to answer. I don't know how that perception comes out there, but I feel confident that if you feel that perception is out there that you could deal with it. CBS has gotten a question on all four of the news conferences. I don't know if it's been you on all four. Um, have, you ever, have you ever told us what your question is? Certainly not. Have you? Of course not. Have you? Nope. You've only gotten one. So have you? <laughs> <laughs> Peter, have you? Uh, Did Mark not. know? Neither, Did Mark tell us? Not, neither I. Major? No. Jake? Michael? We didn't get one. We didn't get one. Jeffrey, but did you give us a heads up on your question last time? What do you think? <laughs> there you go. Good answer. I like that. That's actually, you might get one next time because that was uh, a keen answer. And did you let us know? I think these are rhetorical. Okay. But Robert, but Robert, but they are rhetorical questions because they're easily answered. At a third world country, and we've seen a press conference with, you know, Planted foot. Planted question. The perception. That question wasn't planted. No, that question planted wasn't planted. Planted questioner. The perception, you know, suddenly Chuck, that would have is, any, is Richard Engel reporting from Tehran using Twitter? Uh, we have a reporter. Is he? We have a reporter in Tehran. But, so Richard's not. Richard is not. No. But, we but have a Richard's not using Tehran. Twitter. Richard's not Twitter. using information he got from people. We're using information okay. all over the place, but we're yes, seeing live but, bodies on the ground. Too. But but Robert, as many of us who are on the campaign trail remember, in Iowa, when there were two episodes where candidate Obama's chief rival, Hillary Clinton, was accused of having planted questioners no, in no, town no, no, halls. No, 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 no. No, no, it no, became no, no, a question no, 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 of her no, no, authenticity no, 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 or her ability no, 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 no. to handle. Let's be clear. Town hall. Not, not that I knew I should call on major, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what. Forget, forget the Iowa outlet. Call on major because the question he's going to ask is X. Okay, you're saying, and I will be definitive. Nobody at, at any outlet has ever told me uh, that they were going to ask a certain question, including the fact that I was going to pick or the president might pick somebody from the Huffington Post to ask a question by an Iranian but didn't know what the question was. But why not use a senior so that, chart and just difference. let the president call on who he is rather than go to specific well, I, I, you know, I, used to be called I, by so, the president at a press conference. What are the rules? Yes. I, they're not written. Uh, I'm, I'm happy. Look, I'm happy to have you guys yell. I'm cool with that. Okay. You want to do that? We'll, uh, just one more. No, no. Let's, uh, you know what? I'll forget where I've gone. Right. I'm going to... Uh, I'm not going to, go ahead, yell a little bit louder, if I can almost hardly hear you. Yes, ma'am. The perception is, though, however, everything. Well, let, let, me, let me finish, no, no, please. I'm not going to let you finish. On the first day in political science class, the teacher says there's perception and there's reality. Well, the Every reality one of you all have talked about the reality, so I'm not going to deal with well, the Robert, perception. Allow me, please allow me to finish, okay? I, we live in America of speak. Thank you. There you go. The perception is this is scripted. From the day well, that it's wrong. It, okay. It's wrong. But from the day this administration walked in the door, there was a perception that you were calling people, telling them you will be picked. And that yeah. was the perception. And it's out there. And then to put yeah. this person from the Huffington Post, it, 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 it was all. April, you got picked. Did you get told you were going to get picked? White House press conference pick. No, yeah. I was not told. I was, did, I was surprised. Were you, did you know what? Did, did I ask you what question? You know what I'm going to ask you when I ask I, you. That is more than a safe bet. But, so, how, but how do you decide on that list of people that you're going to say the president has a list? I'm going to go through that I, list. It's just a series of educated so guesses. Do you want to ask about something that the American people actually care about? <laughs> they do care about this, Jay. They want to make sure that we are out there being accountable for them. Jeff, they do uh, want to know. On the immigration meetings tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, at the White House, what is the president's... Uh, um, a lot of people on the Hill are saying that it's up to the president to lead on this issue. What is his time frame for an immigration bill? And does he think it's better in the second two years 
of his uh, first term as opposed to the first two. Well, well, Jeff, I think tomorrow, again, the president has had, has started some conversations, uh, bless you, on this issue. Um, the president had the Congressional Hispanic Caucus uh, at the White House earlier this year. And tomorrow, both sides of the aisle and both sides of the issue will be represented. I think in many ways, how this moves forward, uh, I think the president wants to talk with members of Congress uh, and share uh, different opinions and viewpoints as to uh, what the best path forward is, understanding that the president strongly believes that the only way to deal with this is through a comprehensive reform plan. So I think the president hopes that tomorrow we continue that conversation uh, and he'll get more information uh, from Congress about what they see as the path forward as well. It sounds like he's following Congress on this issue as opposed to leading Congress on this Well, no, I think he's working with Congress to try to figure out how best to move forward and ultimately uh, pass into law comprehensive uh, Comprehensive how, how is his, um, so his promise to kind of create a, a path to citizenship um, for illegal residents, how is that affected by the current economic climate in this country? Has that made the politics harder for him or something like that? Well, you know, look, I, I think the, the, the politics of, uh, of this, I, I'm not sure I want to get into really discussing the politics of this. I think many of, uh, many of us have, have watched the debate over the course of many years. The president was a participant in the debate uh, uh, in, in 2006 in the Senate. And I think, quite honestly, um, I think one of the things that, that he hopes to hear and wants to hear from folks is, uh, based on what we know and have learned from those debates, does that affect uh, uh, the path forward? And I think that's part of the dialogue and the continuing dialogue he wants to have. Major. Robert, in advance of tonight's town hall, the mm -hmm. ABC Washington Post poll shows that, I want to read five categories where more than three quarters of those who responded said they were either somewhat concerned or very mm -hmm. concerned. They reduce, they would suffer a reduction in the quality of their health care. They would reduce health care coverage. That they'd have their choices of doctors or treatments limited that it would increase government bureaucracy in the healthcare system and would sharply increase the federal deficit. The president has extensively addressed all of mm -hmm. these issues, trying as hard as he can and as hard as you, have, you can to reassure the American people this wouldn't happen. And yet, more than three quarters of the survey have either somewhat heavy concerns or very heavy concerns about all of these. What is what, what is the missing link here between well, what the president has said yeah. and you have said and what the American people are hearing and responding to about well, this debate? I think, um, uh, like, I think there are a lot of numbers out there. I think there, I mean, I think the one of the top line numbers in the poll showed uh, a similar number, uh, very or somewhat, right, very or somewhat concerned about the rising cost and the notion that that rising cost will greatly impede um, either their ability to gain access to health insurance or for their family or business to continue uh, to have it. Um, look, I think... But as the president conceded, we're going to get closer and closer to the details. Mm -hmm. And these questions and these levels of concern speak to the details. Right. Well, I think one, I mean, I, I think one, I think the president is, um, is anxious to address many of the very issues that are in this poll directly with the American people through the town hall. I mean, I think he's found this a, an, engaging, uh, an engaging way um, in direct questioning to set aside myths from fact. Um, you know, I think, I mean, in, you know, increasing the deficit, as we talked about a minute ago, uh, this is a plan that will be fully paid for. And in many ways, because the president will require a significant change in the way uh, and the efficiency with which health care is done through Medicare and Medicaid, uh, that that's actually going to, uh, over the long term, uh, help us get back on a path toward fiscal responsibility. Um, you know, I, 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 reductions in the amount of coverage, uh, obviously one of the goals ultimately of this legislation is to increase. I, 
Look, I, I, I think, question, yeah. Obviously, tonight he looks forward to the opportunity, but he has had several bites at this app. He right. has had right. many opportunities. Look, he's I, had town halls. He's addressed a lot of these questions, and yet yeah. well, these I detailed think, levels of anxiety remain. And well, my, my sense is, Major, that uh, because this is an issue that we've de debated and dealt with and not acted on in 40 years, that... Um, uh, and I think people of the veterans of the past few battles can tell you that the numbers that they see in some of these cases crop up each and every year. It's uh, it's a it's it is a complex and difficult issue uh, to work through in order to make sure that people understand. I think that's what the president hopes tonight will begin to do is lessen. Uh, Does he need to do something different? Uh, I think the only thing he needs to continue to do is discuss the issue and do it in a way um, that addresses directly from the American people the concerns that they have. I think the president believes that uh, if, if uh, the American people uh, have a chance to hear all of the sides of the argument, pro and con, uh, that in the end that they'll believe uh, quite strongly that health care reform is something that must be done, that can be done, and ultimately uh, and ultimately will be done. Robert, Mark, Robert, Robert, Robert. Uh, uh, the President, of course, has expressed his sadness and condolence. I'm sorry. Do you want no, to no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. The President's obviously con con expressed his sadness and, and condolences for those who were killed in the, in the horrible tragedy of the subway accident, and, and, <coughs> about it. and you have too, but uh, there's a growing concern that a lack of funding may have contributed to what happened. And as I understand it, there is not, no line item m mention, no line item uh, in the President's budget for Metro funding, for the Washington, D.C. funding. And I was wondering, are you planning to move on that? What your general take is on that? What your reaction is to this? Uh, Where do we go from here? I, I don't have anything directly with me on the funding, but I will try to. I will get you an answer right after, uh, right after Any this. Comments on what caused it or where we're going? Well, or? I mean, look, I, I mean, I think we're all. Um, I mean, I, I think it's probably a safe bet that if each and every person in this room either is. Is, takes part in using the metro system. Uh, it's a wonderful system. Um, uh, I think the president wants to be assured and wants to be able to assure people that uh, it's, uh, it's up to date and it's fully safe. I think the record of metro um, in many ways demonstrates that. Uh, and I think he wants to ensure that NTSB and others have all that they need to find out what may or may not have caused this accident and how best to deal with ensuring that uh, this sort of tragedy never happens again. I yes, went to Iraq, Robert. As you know, there was another bombing today. That toll, I guess, the last count was 56. The latest in a series of these. Has the president given any thought to asking that U.S. troops remain in cities beyond the deadline that they talked about? If not, why not? Because it's pretty horrific. Well, I think uh, the president has heard, and I think many of you have heard from directly from General Odierno, um, that uh, we are going to uh, keep uh, our deadline of June 30th, uh, as the agreement states, with, uh, with Iraq. Um, I think the president, I know the president has had meetings um, and continues to have meetings about uh, ensuring that we're making sufficient political progress on the ground. Uh, and I think you'll see uh, in the coming <coughs> weeks uh, an even greater focus um, from our part on that. Um, but again, I think General Odierno has mentioned that uh, we have seen violence greatly decrease even in the past many months uh, from what it was, uh, and he feels confident in moving forward. The President has had no second thoughts on this subject, and he's not approached the Iraqis about changing. No. No. Yeah. Back on health care, what the President said nine days ago. Uh, what he said, if you like your health pl care plan, mm -hmm. you'll be able to keep your health care plan, mm -hmm. period. No one will take it away, no matter what. 
Is that statement now inoperative? No, let me, let me, well, let me talk a little bit about that statement. I think, I think what the, pre the president, as the president said yesterday, um, our failure to act means thousands of people each day are losing their doctor because they're losing their health care. They're losing access to, through, their, through a, an insurance plan that they either buy individually or as a family or buy uh, as part of an employer system, um, that they get an opportunity uh, to see a doctor. And if we don't do anything, there's no question that people are going to lose that opportunity. Um, there have been discussions, I know we've gotten questions here about CBOs looking at unfinished products and discussing the notion of what number of people might move from a private insurance plan into the health exchange or health marketplace if there is a so-called public option. Now, what, and I don't know which specific bill has these firewalls in them, but in some of the pieces of legislation, there are mechanisms that prevent an individual from, uh, prevent an employer from doing this and prevent an individual from that already has insurance from declining their employer-based insurance in order to go on to a public option. So if, in other words, if you decline ABC's health insurance and it, you can't, you're not going to be able to, under some of the provisions in this legislation, you're not going to be able to decline that coverage from your employer and go out into, into these health marketplaces and these health exchanges. Um, the health exchanges are in place primarily to deal with those that either don't have access to a health insurance plan as part of their employer or have found that on the individual market um, it's far too complicated and far too expensive. The, the point though is the, is the concept the president has told America. Oh, and I should say this, that the president, I think the president said clearly yesterday, nothing that we do on health reform will, will cause the government to say, Ann, you can't go see Dr. Smith anymore. You've got to go see Dr., you know, George. But the concept is that the concept that people heard from the president is if you like your plan, you're paying for your plan, you like your doctor, you can keep it. That's still and true. And that concept no longer <clears throat> really can hold for those who, uh, who, whose employers might change. change well, if an employer, I'm sorry, explain your last part of your example. If an employer decides, help if, me understand you. For your... Americans who want to keep the plan and right. the doctor they've got now, that concept isn't going to work if there's if if companies do opt out of the current coverage that you, well, you but, can't but understand that there will be well understand though on. and there'll be incentives uh, to ensure that if an employer monetarily that there will be an incentive that will in almost all rational economic decision making prevent an employer from dropping their insurance and simply dumping you out into the health exchange, right? You won't, uh, you know, uh, uh, without getting into what detail or what level, let's use ABC, that's a, a, a fairly large company. Um, if ABC were to do that, they're going to have to pay into a system uh, they're going to have to pay into a system. I think almost every company would find it far more economical um, or else the incentive would be uh, perverse to ensure that that doesn't happen. Will he continue to use this phrase? You can yeah, keep I think, your plan uh, yes, I, I, think, uh, I think based on, again, the firewalls in many of these pieces of legislation, there are incentives, again, that prevent businesses from, from unnecessarily dropping coverage, mostly because, one, we think businesses want very much to provide coverage. That's an incentive. 
that's in many ways, and we've seen industries throughout America that have used health benefits as an incentive to find workers. Uh, and as I said, somebody, you can't simply decline, I can't decline my employer's insurance in order to go out onto the public market or, and, and I, I think I should also just clarify, understand that, a, that the health exchange or the health marketplace is simply an avenue with which you will be able to, an individual will be able to choose among many different options, uh, one of which might be a public option. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Robert.